All right, everyone, we're going to get started. We're so glad to see everyone. Welcome this evening to UT Southwestern Science Cafe. I see some of our regulars, and for all of you, welcome back. For our new guests, we are so pleased to meet you this evening. My name is Jenny King and I'm part of the public affairs team at UT Southwestern and on behalf of my colleagues, Joya Lang and Charlandra Thompson, as well as our wonderful guest speakers, Dr. Julie Mirpuri, Dr. Danielle Robertson, and Dr. Kirsten Tolchin Francis, thanks for joining us tonight. Science Cafes are online conversations where our speakers take you on deep dives into science topics. We want to have fun while we learn and our format is casual and interactive. We encourage you to ask questions and engage with us during the program. This evening is a very special episode, getting to know UT Southwestern's If Then Ambassadors. We have three fantastic doctors and leaders in STEM, and we are actually going to extend our program by five minutes so that we can show you a really terrific video before we get started. So more on our guest speakers in just a moment. Before we show the video, I just want to mention a couple technical matters. As you know, I just mentioned that we are recording tonight's program. We also are live streaming this on Twitter, on our UT Southwestern Twitter page, in fact. Go ahead and mute your microphones to help everyone's audio, audio clarity, and please unmute if you are called on to ask a question. We encourage you to utilize the chat feature to list your questions for our doctors, and we will start Q&A at the conclusion of our presentations. Joya is facilitating Q&A, Charlie is our backup for everything, and we are monitoring your questions in the chat box. I also want to welcome the Girl Scouts who are on our program this evening. I know we have at least two troops of Girl Scouts, and so we're so glad that you joined us tonight. And uh, a quick background, and then we'll go right into the If Then video. The If Then exhibit is pretty fantastic. It is a national initiative of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or the, the AAAS. And Lida Hill Philanthropies, which is a homegrown, wonderful nonprofit supporting many good things, including STEM programs. The if then title comes from the phrase, if we can support a woman in STEM, then she can change the world. If she can see it, then she can do it. The exhibit is on display at North Park Mall in North Dallas until October 24th. We encourage each of you to attend if you haven't already. It's pretty mind boggling to see all of these statues together and to use your QR codes and to learn about these scientists and women in STEM. And you can go online and see it as well. So let's get started with our video. Give us a second, we're having some technical fun tonight. Volume. Charlie, if you could either unmute yourself so we can hear your speaker or you can share your sound. Found less than six statues. Let's start over. On public display. Okay. There are thousands of statues of historical figures displayed across the United States. But think for a moment. Can you remember the last time you came across a statue honoring a woman? For example, Manhattan Central Park currently has 23 statues honoring male historical figures like William Shakespeare and Christopher Columbus, but not a single statue honoring a real woman. A study of 12 major U.S. cities found less than six statues of real women total on public display in parks and downtown areas. Yes, less than six. Well, that number is about to skyrocket when hashtag If Then She Can, the exhibit debuts in May 2020. This monumental exhibit will feature the most statues of women ever assembled in one location at one time. 
Over 120 statues of real female STEM professionals from a wide variety of industries will be displayed in Dallas's North Park Center from May through October 2020. This free exhibit is presented by Lida Hill Philanthropies If Then Initiative. If Then aims to empower current female STEM innovators as role models and inspire the next generation of girls to pursue STEM careers. Each life-size statue honors an If Then ambassador and was created using state-of-the-art 3D printing technology. We're going to be 3D full body scanning you in the scanner to our left, and the final product will be a full size print of you. Three, two, one. There it is. That's good. Nice. This is gorgeous. These pictures are combined to create a 3D model, which is 3D printed layer by layer. Once the statues are printed and fully hardened with UV light, they are refined. After that, the final step is painting. So we have one of the final prints that's already been painted, all dried and cured and ready for display. When the process is finished, over 120 statues of female STEM innovators will have their stories shared in this first of its kind exhibit. If Then is making history and truly inspiring the next generation of girls to realize their potential. Because if she can see it, then she can be it. Thank you, Charlie, for playing that. So we just think this is um, a wonderful program and we're honored that we have four ambassadors at UT Southwestern. One is on maternity leave, but three of them are here with us tonight and we're going to hear from them about their careers and their uh, work as an ambassador. First, we have Dr. Julie Mercury. She is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at UT Southwestern. She is a neonatal perinatal physician scientist. Next is Dr. Danielle Robertson, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at UT Southwestern. She is also the director of the Advanced Dry Eye Specialty Clinic. And finally, we have Dr. Kirsten Tolchin Francis, who is an assistant professor for the Prosthetics and Orthotics Program at the Department of Healthcare Sciences. She is also the division director of movement science at Scottish Rite for Children. And I said her first name wrong, Dr. Kirsten Tolchin Francis. I'm so sorry. Uh, without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Mirpuri. The virtual podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my experience with the If Then Ambassadorship and how the ambassadors are using it to promote STEM amongst actually generations uh, Zers, not Xers. So if you can go to the next slide. So I wanna first start with a poll question and I wanna ask the audience, how many of you have watched the X-Files? That number is changing significantly. Okay, so it looks like about 40% have actually watched the X-Files. And if we can go to the next slide, I'll tell those of you who uh, have not watched the X-Files um, a little bit about uh, the show. So basically the X-Files is a show that features this very strong woman called Dana Scully. And she is um, uh, an MD and a forensic pathologist and an FBI agent. And it's a show that I grew up with. And for those of you who remember the show, she was a super strong character in this world dominated by men. And there's an institute called the uh, Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. And they conducted a survey uh, among women in STEM, and they found that women who watched the X-Files regularly were 50% more likely to work in STEM careers. And of those who watched uh, Scully and her, Scully's character, 63% of them said that watching Scully increased their confidence that they could excel in a male-dominated profession. So uh, that is what's known as the Scully effect. And we need many more Scullys out there. And that's what the If Then Ambassadorship for me is really about. If you can go to the next slide, please. So 
the IFTEL ambassadorship is basically about creating role models because we really don't have enough women in STEM careers. And to give you an idea, how many women do you think uh, when have ever traveled to space among the 566 individuals who have been to space? 6%, 12%, 24%, 30%, or 48%? A couple seconds here. Looks like 6% uh, is winning at 70%. And it's actually a little bit better than what most people think. So most 71% uh, said that it's 6%, it's actually just under 12%, 11.5%. But that's still quite sad. So we need many, many more women to be able to go into aerospace, engineering, and mathematics. And if you can go to the next slide. So uh, this, uh, these two graphs basically show the number of percent of women that are represented in different STEM fields. So um, it, the bars basically on the left represent the percent of women. The light blue is the number of women who had bachelor's, master's, or doctorates in 1997. And the green is the percent that had them in 2016. And on one side, you can see my field, the biomedical sciences, is actually more represented, more equal distribution of women than men. But there are many fields which really do not have enough women in them. That includes engineering, aerospace, uh, sciences, technology, and really only about 20% or even less uh, are women. And we really need to do better with that. So if you can go to the next slide, that's the purpose of the If Then Ambassadorship, is to create to show young girls and women out there that there are real contemporary role models and to hopefully influence young girls and sh by showing them these different career pathways and influence their career choice in the future. Um, so this was an application process. So women in various uh, STEM careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics applied and we had to submit a video and reasons why we wanted to join the initiative. Uh, as you heard, it's funded by Lida Hill Philanthropies, and they selected 125 women ambassadors, and we're so lucky to be, uh, the, you know, four of them from UT Southwestern, and we are the high-profile contemporary role models for middle school girls, and our goal and our charge is to lead by example, and also for, uh, for us to enhance our outreach. I can tell you as a physician scientist, it's very easy to get stuck in your own little bubble and just do research and work with your patients. And this has been a great program to give me the opportunities to be able to go out to schools, uh, be involved in social media, to show young people out there that, hey, this is an amazing field. So maybe you can join it too. If we can go to the next slide, please. So as you heard the purpose of the If Then Initiative, uh, we were all allowed to make little yes, if then and statements. And, and you know, one of my favorite if then statements is if she knows about it, then she'll be able to be it. Because if you don't even know there's a STEM career like that, then you're never even going to be able to follow that career path. And I think that's one of the other things that the if then initiative does. And you heard it's, it's implemented by the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, but also has a lot of coalition partners, including National Geographic, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm a physician scientist, and I think it is an extremely attractive area, a, a, attractive field in STEM. Um, to become the physician part, I completed medical school. Uh, in, in medical school, you know, I just fell in love with being able to take care of kids. And so I decided to residency in pediatrics. I did a fellowship in neonatology, and uh, my role is a neonatologist. So I'll take you to the next poll question. Uh, which is, what is a neonatologist? Hopefully somebody that you'll never get to meet, but is it someone who is specialized in studying the kidney, someone specialized in studying the brain and neurological system, or someone who specializes in the care of preterm and sick babies in the ICU? And everybody knows the answer to this question. Uh, so I, uh, I am somebody, I am a neonatologist and I uh, specialize in the care of preterm and sick babies in the ICU. If you can go to the next slide, please. So it's a, it's a very unique field and it's a very challenging field. So 
Um, basically, I take care of babies who are born too soon and babies who are born when they were supposed to come, but have maybe challenges in the development of their heart, their kidneys, their intestine. And we provide them with the intensive care for them to get better and go home with their parents. It's challenging because of the sheer size of the patients that I take care of. I can tell you the smallest patient I ever took care of was, was 390 grams. To put that in context, a baby literally could fit in the palm of my hand. Um, and it's a very unique field because you know it's not like adult medicine. It's a very specialized group of individuals. And you know, aside from needing very, very small you know, IVs and blood pressure cuffs. You also need specialized equipment like this uh, image there of a giraffe where you can keep the babies warm and make sure that they don't lose uh, heat and fluid. And though it's a challenging field, I'll tell you it's a very, very fulfilling field because fortunately the science has developed so much that most of the babies can go home with their parents and actually do quite well and are the best, become the best that they can be. And it's all about building relationships. So a neonatologist does not work alone. We work with nurses, respiratory therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants. And if you ever visit um, a NICU, you'll see a whole group of people working together to care for these very, very tiny babies. Um, and the other relationships that I, you, we get to build is the ones with the parents. And I can't tell you how wonderful it is to get postcards from time to time from the parents of the babies I took care of and see them get older and grow up and go to college. And, and that is like one of the most fulfilling parts of the field. So that's the physician part. Can you go to the next slide, please? And then I'm also um, a scientist. So for everybody out there, what kind of research do you think physicians uh, can be involved in? What kind of research and science? Is it just research involving humans, research involving cells and tissue? research involving bacteria and viruses and animal models, research in quality improvement, research involving large data sets and bioinformatics, or all of the above. And this is a very, very smart audience because you know when all of the above is there, it's usually all of the above. And yes, it's all of the above. And, and I just wanted to show you the depth and breadth of research that physicians can do. And you're gonna hear a, a lot more about that from my two colleagues who are speaking later. Um, but if you can go to the next slide. Uh, once I discovered uh, the science part or the scientist part of being a physician as a fellow, um, and I joined a laboratory and I just fell in love with it because I could take the questions that I had in the hospital and bring it to the lab and study better ways to help the babies that I take care of. And so I did what, I, what they, we call an instructorship after I completed my fellowship to learn about immunology, which is about the immune cells, mainly in the intestine, and also about the microbiome. So the microbiome is all the bacteria that live on us and inside us. And my research is focused on understanding how the bacteria that lives inside us interacts to help the immune system develop. Um, I'm now an independent principal investigator. I do primarily basic science research, uh, I have some tissue models and some mouse models, but I also do translational work. And you'd be surprised to know that one of the things that I love studying is poop, because actually poop has a lot of bacteria and gives us insight into the bacteria that's inside the baby's body. So we collect poop from the babies that we take care of in the ICU. I store them in freezers and we study that in uh, tissue culture and animal models to help us understand how best to help preterm babies grow and not develop disease. If you can go to the next slide, please. So as I said before, our target audience is Generation Z. And I think there are a couple of Generation Zers out there. And so this won't be a surprise to you, but it was a surprise to me to learn a little bit about Generation Z. So these are individuals born between 1997 to 2015. And we'll go to the next poll question. Uh, so for all of you out there, what do you think is the typical attention span of a generation zero? Is it five seconds, eight seconds, 12 seconds, 20 seconds, or 30 seconds? And here we're all over the place. So I think we've got most in. So you, you'll be surprised to know that what, what one was 12 seconds, but it's actually less than that. So a typical generation zero only has an attention span of about eight seconds. So if you can go to my next slide, um, you know, 
Generation Z is a fascinating generation. It's now 22% of the US population. And they have an eight second attention span. So you have to get their attention quickly, which is why videos and uh, pictures really, really work. They're also like the social media generation and, and they're involved in Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and TikTok. And so we all as ambassadors really had to learn how to get involved in social media and engage this particular audience. What I love about Generation Zers is they prefer to see real people rather than celebrities in their ads. They just wanna hear things as they are. They want the truth. They don't want you to sugarcoat it, which is really fascinating. And so I'll take you to my next question. If you can move to the next slide, which is as I've engaged with Generation Zers, what do you think is the most common question I get asked by them? Do you have kids? What do you do for fun? What kind of doctor are you? Do you like what you do? Or was it difficult to become a doctor and a scientist? And I've been asked all these questions, but the number one question I've been asked, and it looks like the winner is, do you like what you do? Actually, that's not the number one question I get asked. The number one question I get asked is, what do you do for fun? So I, I wonder if, you know, people, the young generation in general think that, you know, a physician scientist must be somebody with thick glasses and kind of boring. And they always get quite surprised to hear that I love to dance and uh, I, I like uh, Taylor Swift and I like little Nas X and I even like uh, K-pop. And they're like, oh, really? Like they get really shocked by that. But I think that's the beauty of the If Then Initiative. You know, we're all contemporary uh, scientists uh, in various STEM fields. And it is fun and we can be passionate about what we can do. And I, I hope it does inspire them. So if you can move to the next slide. So another thing I've, I've learned from this If Then initiative is it's so important to know your audience when you're trying to engage people in science. And, and I've really been le loving learning about Generation Z. They're realistic. Uh, they wanna know about the pros and cons and you have to be very engaging and really utilize multiple media platforms. And my next goal for the next month is actually to join Instagram so I can engage more of the Generation Zers. Um, to end, if you can go to the next slide, you know, I, I've loved this experience. It's been give, given me the opportunity to engage with middle school girls, you know, meet multiple scientists from many different backgrounds. Uh, you know, I've gotten to meet uh, Lida Hill, who's phenomenal. I've been able to interact. I've actually met Gina Davis, who's very tall and amazing woman. Uh, you know, women from different backgrounds who do rocket science, engineering, uh, and, you know, really humble to have myself represented in, as an orange statue. So with that, I'll pass it on to my co-ambassador, uh, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I, I have to say that um, you had me lost after Taylor Swift. <laughs> But um, yeah, so uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight, talk a little bit about what it's like to be an ambassador. And um, like Julie, uh, like Dr. Mirpuri, I am also a clinician scientist and I do eye research. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, talking about what it's like to be a clinician scientist in ophthalmology and vision science. And um, I also, I included my, my statue at the right. I think that was one of the coolest things I've done short of having my son. And um, even watching that video tonight, I remember when Lida first showed it to us when she had us there all together and we all had goosebumps and I kind of got goosebumps again just watching it tonight. So it's definitely been a phenomenal experience and I hope you've all have had a chance uh, to go up and see it. And if not, it's there through, I believe, October 23rd. So uh, let's jump in. Next slide, please. So this kind of was my, my whole passion for wanting to be a part of this program is if we expose a young girl to STEM, her opportunities will be endless. So I grew up in a super tiny town in Washington State, in central Washington. Um, it is so small that I actually flew back about 10 years ago and drove through a stoplight because I didn't know it was there, but they had to put it in because we finally got a McDonald's. And when I was growing up, I never knew a physician that was a female. I never knew a scientist that was a female. And I certainly did not know a woman who was a clinician scientist. In fact, I, I was thinking about this the other day. I don't even think I knew what a clinician scientist was. Um, 
and I definitely took a really circuitous windy path to get where I am but it, it's been a really incredible ride and I just want to be able to you know reach out and let other girls out there know that you know there are these incredible opportunities out there and you know it's all about exposure so they can they can see it because if they can see it they can be it next slide please and, um, you know, it's really, like I said, it's all about exposure. And I put this in. This is kind of one of the cool things about the If Then program. They have this large asset collection where they've photographed us and they've made cool posters to put up at schools and different types of organizations where young girls go. And, and this is just an example of one. This is actually a museum. This is the International Museum of Surgical Science. It's in Chicago. And this is the fifth floor, it's the ophthalmology exhibit. And that's an exhibit about me. So young girls can go by and look at all these exciting things and then see this real person who's there and actually working in the field. And um, if you, when you read the board, it talks about how for 15 years, I was the only female scientist in my department. And that's just recently changed, which I'm so excited to have a new mini me in the department to help mentor but um, I just think it's really important for girls to see things like this and know everyday women we're out there doing these things. Uh, next slide please. So there's different types of eye docs and I think this is a huge area of confusion for some. So an OD which is what my clinical degree is is um, an optometrist so an optometrist, if you look at the picture on the right, um, anyone who's had an eye exam is familiar with this, which is better one or two. An optometrist is going to fit glasses and contacts, figure out what prescription you need so we can help you see better. Um, an optometrist also works to diagnose eye diseases. So we treat and diagnose a range of eye diseases from the front to the back of the eye. In contrast to that, an ophthalmologist, which is an MD, they're someone that <clears throat> excuse me, also does all of those things, but in addition, they do surgery. And so one of the great things about UT Southwestern and the Department of Ophthalmology is I have colleagues that specializes, specialize in all areas of the eye. So when I have patients come into my clinic and they need surgery on their cornea or they need a cataract removed or treatment for their retina, then I can send them out to the ophthalmologist who's going to do that procedure and get them get their vision back to be its best that it can be. And then lastly, there's a PhD, which is a vision scientist. And that's what I am. I have a PhD in vision science. And I, that's someone who, we do bench research. We do basic research for in the lab. Kind of like Julie said, we work with cells, tissues, animals, and things. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we can combine these different types of degrees to become a clinician scientist and some of the cool things that we get to do. Next slide, please. So a clinician scientist, kind of like Dr. Mirpiri said, it's all about translational research. So kind of like the goal of, of what I do is I go to the clinic, I see patients with really severe eye disease, corneal disease, dry eye, and I try to identify what are the unmet needs in patient care, what are the barriers that we have, what do I need to be able to treat these patients and improve their quality of life and help them be able to see. And then we go to the lab and the goal is to take those things that we identify as these unmet critical needs and, and work in the lab to try to find cures, solutions for those things. How can we prevent disease and how can we treat it? And then of course it, it goes full circle because we then try to take what we learn in the lab and take it back to the patients in the clinic. And that's what translational research is and we use this term bench to bedside because we want to take what we do in the lab at the lab bench and take it all the way back to the patient in the, at the bedside. Next uh, slide please. So my specific area is cornea and ocular surface. So the cornea, if you look here, is basically the clear dome that sits on the front of the eye. Um, I like to tease all my retina friends that if the cornea is not clear, it doesn't matter what the rest of the eye looks like. Um, and, and to a certain extent, it's true. So we study different things on how 
um, different uh, diseases like autoimmune diseases and diabetes, how they affect the health of the cornea. And we also study things like contact lens wear and how do contact lenses affect the front of the eye and if you don't use your contact lenses correctly, how does that lead to infection? So one of the coolest things I think about the cornea, and whenever I give a lecture on the cornea, I always kind of start out with saying, the cornea is truly a unique tissue. And the reason it's unique is because it's clear, it's transparent, right? This is how we see that cornea is a big lens in the front of our eye that focuses light so we can see. And because it's transparent, it doesn't have blood vessels, it gets all of the blood from the oxygen, it has a very unique uh, location for its stem cells. And the whole mechanism of how the cornea works is different than many other tissues. And because it's optically transparent, we can actually image it in the clinic. So if you look to the right, if we'll play that video, please. This is actually a human cornea. This was my PhD mentor's cornea. And so we have a special type of microscope that we can actually shine light in so we have a long wavelength red laser that's perfectly safe for the human eye. And every time it hits a surface, and what you see all of these spots in here, um, all these little spots, these are nuclei in the cells, and you can see some long lines in there, those are nerves. Anytime you hit a nerve or a reflective surface, it bounces the light back. And we can actually do a 3D reconstruction of a patient's cornea in the clinic. And this is great for patients that have diabetes. I'm gonna show an example how we can look at nerves, we can look at immune cells. And in some cases with infections, I can actually look at a patient and diagnose their infection, what's caused it, without us ever having to culture the cornea. And that means we can get treatment to that patient so much faster. Next slide, please. There we go. So this is a confocal microscope. This is what it looks like. I have one in the lab that I use on my lab rats, and I also have one in the clinic. And uh, mine's a bit of a special kind because it was re-engineered by one of my biomedical engineering colleagues. But this is actually just a case I happened to have last week. This was a young person who came in, a history of contact lens wear. They had gone swimming with their contact lenses and unfortunately they presented with a severe eye infection and this is everywhere you see white here that's basically all inflammation and scarring it's what's going to scar up that patient will probably eventually have to have a corneal transplant so our job was to see hey can i use my microscope to look at this patient's eye and identify if we know what it is so we did just that and this is actually a picture here that I took of that patient's um, eye with that microscope. And you see all these little white spots all clustered together, you see these? Those are parasites. So that is an amoeba, it's called a canthamoeba. You get a canthamoeba most commonly because you swim with your contact lenses on and those parasites stick to the lens and then a few days later they transfer to the eye. And so we actually took that patient's eye, we did a little uh, culture on the front, so we took a little bit of tissue and I brought it back to the lab and grew it out to confirm uh, my diagnosis. And you can see all the parasites here. So um, unfortunately, that's a really hard disease to treat. It can be blinding um, and that patient's in for a very long road ahead. But fortunately, we've been able to get the diagnosis and now we have that patient on treatment and we're gonna be able to save the eye. Uh, next slide, please. And so just to kind of give you an idea of the spectrum of things that we work with. So in the lab, I, or in the clinic, I have a clinical interest to look at eye infections, but actually in the lab, we do research, and that's one of the things we study is, how do we get eye infections? What can we do differently? What can we do to beef up our immune system in the eye to try to prevent organisms from giving us eye infections? And then can we come up with better ways, more effective ways to treat these? Particularly in the time of antibiotic resistance when we know that some of these things might have been treatable with certain antibiotics and now we're finding it harder and harder and harder to treat. And these are really kind of the three most common groups of microbial pathogens that we that we really worry about. These are our big 800 pound gorillas. Uh, this first one is Pseudomonas and that's a bacteria 
And in the United States, the most common bacteria that's going to cause an eye infection is Pseudomonas. Um, and Pseudomonas is everywhere. It's in soil, it's in water. If you touch the grocery store door handle going in tonight, you've probably touched Pseudomonas. But you aren't going to get a Pseudomonas infection unless you've injured your eye, unless you haven't used your contact lenses correctly, or maybe you have something going on with your, your health system and you're immunosuppressed. So um, in general, you're pretty safe from these, but they can happen. Uh, this is actually a fungal infection. This is a fungus called Fusarium. Um, fungal infections are pretty rare unless you live in tropical climates. The most common reason we see a fungal infection would either be someone who's really immunosuppressed, or we see them in people that work in the yard. They're out doing work. At common, they come in all the time, they're not wearing protective eyewear, out mowing the yard, something flies up, hits them in the eye, and then, you know, a week later they now have an infection, and fungal infections are really tough to treat. And then, of course, this is the parasitic infection like I just showed you, and the number one reason you're going to get that is because you're swimming, you're in a lake, you're in a hot tub, or you're taking a shower with your contact lenses on. Next slide. So one of the um, other things, as I mentioned, we can see in patients with that microscope is we can see corneal nerves. And these are real nerves from a patient. Uh, and what you're looking at here, this is a mouse cornea. And I have stained, I've labeled all the nerves in green. And as that spins around, you can kind of appreciate you have all these long nerves. They kind of run in this thin air thin um, plane, and then you have little nerve fibers that squiggle up. And all those nerves that run in that thin plane, if we close the video, here we come, back to the slide, oops, next slide, oh, there we go. So all of those nerves that run in that plane are exactly the nerves that we see here. So this is really, really interesting. And you can also see these little white cells here and here. Those are actually immune cells in the cornea. So we can see in certain diseases what type of immune cells are coming in and talking to those nerves. Um, next slide. So uh, actually, that's perfect right there. I just want that little green one. Go ahead and hit the video on the green one. Perfect. So you see, those are all those nerves that run to the surface. And anybody that has ever got even maybe the slightest small piece of dust in their eye, a little fuzzy, knows how incredibly painful it is, right? And the reason it is so painful is because the cornea is the most highly innervated tissue in the body. We have more nerves per, per square unit of area in the cornea than anywhere else. And we need that. We need to be able to protect the eye. Well, sometimes certain diseases actually can damage those nerves. And when we lose, start to lose sensation, the cornea and the whole um, ocular surface starts to fall apart. Next slide, please. And so that's because we have um, what's called the nasal lacrimal unit. So the nerves in your cornea are so important for telling your brain when it needs to make tears, when the eyes need to close, what we need for, for our cells in the front of the eye. And if you look over here, this is an example of the tear film. And the tear film is a very, very complex mixture. It's actually a very, very thin uh, fluid layer that lies in front of your eye. We all think of tears, like emotional tears when we cry. But, but when the tear film breaks down, we actually get a disease called dry eye. And dry eye, um, in severe cases, it's debilitating. People can't work, they have no quality of life, and, and it can lead to blindness in severe cases. And at the Advanced Specialty Dry Eye Clinic, I see patients that present with just horrible dry eye, and we have to get really creative sometimes in how we come up with solutions. At, but being able to take a patient who really has almost reached a state where they're just debilitated and can't work and, you know, they just don't have any more enjoyment in life because they can't see and their eyes hurt all the time. And being able to help them and to give that back to them, that freedom, um, and just improve their quality of life is, is such, um, really such a rewarding opportunity, such a rewarding thing to do. Uh, next slide. 
and I think this is probably about where we're going to leave off, but um, so we talk about dry eye disease, and just to kind of reiterate how cool it is to be a clinician scientist, um, on the left side you see what we do clinically. So these are tests that we actually do on patients to assess dry eye when they come in. We measure the height of their tears pooling on that lower eyelid, and that tells us a lot about their tear volume and if they have enough tear volume to protect the front of the eye. Um, this is uh, something we could do called tear breakup time. So we project clear rings, these clear concentric rings on the cornea. The patient blinks and holds their eye open and we see how long they can stay nice and pretty. And if you see here, they start getting all squiggly and that's a sign to me that that tear film is very unstable. And, and if they, it sometimes it only lasts one or two seconds and it breaks up. And that's a patient that's really gonna be having a lot of pain and suffering. Um, this is really cool here. If you think about when like oil and water mix and you can see the little colors that reflect up, uh, we actually use that to look at how thick the oil is in the tear film. And we wanna see lots of pretty colors. And if we don't, then I know that the glands that make those oils are malfunctioning. And that's a certain type of dry eye disease. And then we can treat that effectively. And these are actually the glands, and these are beautiful. These are called meibomian glands. And um, we actually image those and measure how much, how much glandular tissue is there or how much is lost, because that's really important in grading. And you know, one thing being at a medical school where we work with cancer and all these really big diseases, I think it's really important sometimes to back up and put the context of how significant dry eye is in the population. And you hear about things like diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma and cataract. But the number one reason worldwide that patients go to an eye doctor is because they have dry eye. It's the number one reason. It's a horrible public health issue. It's a billion dollar industry. And we do not have good treatments for a lot of these patients. And so patients come in and I put a special dye on their eye and this is what they look like. And these, these are really, really painful conditions. And the last thing I'm gonna show you is we've actually in the lab, you know, we're, we're clinician scientists, so we work at the bench and we work at the bedside. And this is just a mouse and he is just having a little nap. We gave him something to help him sleep. And we're actually measuring his tear production. So that little yellow thread, as he starts to make tears, it'll start to turn red. And it's called a phenol red thread test. And we're measuring his ability to make tears. And so what we've done with some of these mice is we give them a little shot of Botox in the gland that makes the tears, and then they stop making tears, and they actually get a clinical dry eye. So when we do that, you can see this is the normal mouse eye, the mouse cornea, and here is our dry eye mouse cornea, which is just like what we see in the clinic on a severe dry eye patient. So we're using these mice and this model to try to look at some of the different causes for the inflammation that causes the damage in dry eye and to try to come up with some new therapies that we hope someday we can take back to the clinic and really make a difference in their lives. And I think that's it, next slide. And this was a saying that I learned during my graduate school uh, days and I just kind of wanted to share it with you all tonight. Um, Art is I, science is we. And when it comes to STEM advocacy, when it comes to doing great science, or when it comes to providing outstanding patient care, it takes a village. And um, it's just, you know, it's an amazing journey to be a part, be a part of that village and know that you're making a difference in someone's life. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Kirsten. Thanks so much. Um, I know that on my next slide, uh, my video is not going to work. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly if that is okay. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, this will stop the other sharing. So, yes. Is that okay? Um, I have to uh, show at least one of my um, pictures of my statue. Uh, this was such an amazing experience to uh, BNF then an ambassador. And this is me with my statue and my little statue. Um, I had a little mini statue um, printed. I keep it on my desk uh, at work. It's with me all the time. Um, I love it and uh, it's an amazing experience. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I do in biomechanics. Uh, I study 
uh, how children move. I work at Scottish Rite. I'm also a professor at UT Southwestern in prosthetics and orthotics. Um, so uh, I'm going to play a video and I want you to watch the sister do hopscotch and then brother do hopscotch. So here's sister and here comes brother. And we want to know, you know, can you tell some differences between the two of them? So I'm going to play one more time. So here's sister doing double, double, the double stance ones are the ones we want to look at in particular. Here comes brother. So I think as you can see, as brother starts to go, he starts to kind of lean to one side. He's definitely favoring his right leg uh, more than the other. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back. I'm going to stop my share. If you can go ahead and share your screen again in the, in the slides. Um, I guess the big question I want to know is how do we quantify the differences that we saw? I think everyone could see that there was a difference between the way sister and the way brother did the hopscotch. But what we want to know is how can we quantify that? How do we put um, some sort of measurement to that? You can go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, how do we determine, how do we measure it? How do we give our doctors something that they can take and do something with that? <clears throat> Uh, next slide. So uh, a delay. no problem. Kind of it's probably because there's a video that won't play. And you can go ahead and hit again. So uh, uh, my first poll question, and actually go to, hold to the next slide. My first poll question is, has anybody ever heard of motion capture? It's the way they make video games and movie special effects and um, you know animation. <clears throat> So everybody's heard of that. Most people, you got 80%, looks good. All right, we can go ahead and close that out. We got about 80% of that. So I got my second poll question. I'm gonna go ahead and do that now before I go into this, which is uh, how many people have heard of 3D motion capture in the medical field? So using biomechanics to do it for med medicine, maybe for medical or sports applications. So not as many, so maybe now about 50%. Okay, so what I do is I use 3D motion capture in a laboratory setting to understand how people move. So what I'm gonna talk about today a little bit is how we look, why we look at this in a laboratory setting versus real world. And what's the difference between the two? So I'm gonna have you just kind of click a couple of times and there's about four clicks to bring everything up on the screen. Um, so in a laboratory setting, what we can do is we can measure things in a controlled environment. It allows us to kind of regulate or change one variable at a time. So that's an advantage for us. And it can give us an, an idea to challenge what an individual can do. So it gives us an idea to, to give us what their capacity is. What can they do? In the real world, we want to be able to measure what they choose to do. There's a difference there. I like to say, I can go and run. I choose not to go out and run a mile, right? Doesn't mean I can't do it. It's what I choose to do. So I want to test people in the laboratory setting where I can control it and challenge them to see what they can do. But I also want to be able to measure them in the real world and see what they can do. So next slide. <clears throat> So I've already kind of done the poll questions and go ahead and click. So what we do in the lab is we do motion capture and you can pull up, do two more clicks and so it so is the text. So, and then go ahead and play that video for me. So what we do is we do motion capture. So in the picture, you can see we put a bunch of markers, very specific bony landmarks. We palpate specific places. We put markers on the skin. We don't use uh, skin suits like they do in the movies. We don't want that. We want it on the skin so we don't have any motion of the skin suit. We want it on the skin itself. Then what we're doing is we're trying to replicate or track what, what we're trying to do is understand what the bone is doing, so the skeleton underneath. So what we're doing is we're modeling the bones or modeling the skeleton and then tracking that in 3D. So we can basically develop this model on the computer of exactly what the body is doing. And for every one of those segments that we've created in that, in that computer model, 
I mean, this is a nice animation and it's cool for my video that I'm showing you today, but I'm an engineer by background. I'm not a clinician scientist, I'm an engineer. So for me, what this model is, is it's lots of numbers and equations and it's a three-dimensional coordinate system. If you think back to math, X, Y, and Z, I've got a three-dimensional coordinate system for every part of the body that I just tracked, okay? All right, so go ahead and to the next slide. So why do we use motion capture and how do we use it? So here's two girls and they're doing what we call is a drop vertical jump. And this is a test that we can use clinically in a physical therapy gym or a doctor can do it. And it's used a lot to look at knee motion. And it's, it's a great test to see, oh, are they maybe at risk for an injury? Um, what are their biomechanics? Um, we're using it right now in this setting here for motion capture to determine whether or not these patients are at risk for a knee injury. And you can say, well, I can collect this with my video camera and I can determine whether or not um, they're at risk for a knee injury. And I, you can watch them right now and say, well, I, maybe I can see it myself, but it's really hard to do it with your eyes, right? So I'm going to give you some examples. So go to the next slide. So here's an example. So this is looking at whether or not somebody's at risk for a knee injury. So uh, look, there you've got two pictures here. So the one on the left, right, um, is somebody who's doing a single leg squat, okay? And he's got his trunk nice and level over, knee, over his knee. And you can see his knee straight ahead, his knee straight over his foot. It's nice and uh, in a straight line, right? So that's good biomechanics there. He's got nice uh, level, a um, uh, nice straight line. He's got good biomechanics, meaning his trunk is over his knee, which is over his foot, well aligned. In the picture on the left, um, this kid, did, he's in the middle of doing kind of what those two girls did, dropping off that bench behind him. And if you look at, at his, uh, the leg with the green tape, his, I have to, I have to say, turn and look, okay, on his uh, right, uh, his right leg, you can see that his knee, click once for me, his knee is pointed in a little bit. Uh, just click, you can just click once. It's not a video, it's just a picture. Oh, no, wait, go back. Uh, go back one slide for me. There should have been a little animation with a little ring, but that's okay if it doesn't pop up. If you can just circle that knee on the other side. Yeah, right there. Yeah, that's perfect. Circle that knee. There you go. If you look at that knee, see how it's pointed in and how its foot's pointed out to the side? So that is what we call a valgus collapse. We don't want to see that. That's bad biomechanics. Why is that? Is his knee really bent in like that? It's not. So it's it's uh, it's almost eight o'clock. So we're gonna try to try and go through, through this kind of quickly. But I'm gonna get, ask everybody. It's a uh, here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Everyone's had dinner. You're all probably relaxing. I'm gonna ask everyone to stand up for a second. I'm gonna ask you to do something. Stand up. I'm gonna ask you to stand up and squeeze your legs together and then bend your knees a little bit. If you bend your knees a little bit, you're gonna feel like your knees came in. Your knees didn't really bend like that, right? But they're gonna look like his knee did right now, right? They're gonna look like they came in, but they didn't really bend like that. Your knee did not bend in that direction. Normally your knee shouldn't bend in that direction, right? Your knee doesn't have that kind of laxity. Most people don't have laxity in that direction, unless you have a condition that has laxity in that direction. So why is this still bad? Why do we call this a valgus collapse? Because that position puts a very big strain on your knee. And that is that strain is what causes a lot of people to have an ACL injury. That strain overloads your knee when you land like that and that causes an ACL injury. So if you have poor biomechanics, you put yourself at risk for a knee injury. Why is this important to me? Well, obviously it's important to me because I work in this area. I do a lot with, with, uh, with kids uh, and athletes, but I'm also an ACL injury person. I tore my ACL when I was 14. It's one of the reasons why I went into STEM. I was 14, I was a girl, I was fit with a big brace. I loved math and science and I decided I was gonna build a better brace. This is how I got into the STEM field. Like Dr. Mulperry and Dr. Robinson, I didn't have a STEM mentor growing up. I didn't have a girl to look up to, a woman to look up to. I had to leave, lean on my own experiences. And my experience was I hated my knee brace and I was gonna build a better one. And it was all because I had an ACL injury. So I have, this is near and dear to my heart is 
pediatric knee injuries, pediatric sports medicine. And it was a big circle for me. I got injured. I went into engineering and here I am now doing biomechanics and pediatric sports medicine. So this is a big full circle for me. All right. So next slide. For those of you that think you can just do this with a video camera and 2D analysis, I'm going to show you this example. This is a video of someone who's doing this with perfect biomechanics. Only difference is they're landing on two force plates in the ground. Why am I showing you this? This is really important. I have two plates in the ground that measure force. Physics tells us when you exert a force in the ground, the ground exerts an equal and opposite force back up on your foot. We can measure that force. This graph on the right here shows you that force. There's two lines here, one in green and one in red. If you notice very uh, carefully as they land, and you can see there's two arrows underneath their feet in yellow, one of those forces is larger than the other. That green line is higher than the other. So if you were to look at this just with a video camera, snap a video with your camera while they're doing it, you'd see pretty good biomechanics. The force analysis that we can do in our lab will tell you that even though they have good biomechanics in this example, their force distribution is uneven. So we can also get force distribution information that can tell us that they're different. So this is an example of what we do in our lab. This is where I am really passionate about biomechanics, really passionate about what I do. Okay, next slide. Um, real world measurements really quickly. Pretty much everybody's got some sort of watch or device or something that you wear these days. They're all pretty good. However, if you want to do research with them, they're not as good as we want them to be. Most of them are not accurate enough to do research with at the level that I would want to do research with them. Next slide, please. If we want to go with something, you can go ahead and hit two more times. If you want to do something with research, we need something that's got higher resolution, better accuracy, something that has onboard data recording, sampling, and processing, something that has a, a Bluetooth upload to a, a database cloud that allows us to give real-time feedback. Next slide. Which all of this kind of comes back to why did I, why was I chosen for the if then, what is my role in, in STEM outreach? It really started with this program, which is called the PEAR Initiative, which is my third poll question. Um, I work in orthopedics. So according to the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons, um, what percentage of their membership is female? So what percentage of the American, Acad American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons membership is female? So we've got about 50% of people say six and a half percent. That is correct. So in 2019, and the latest um, numbers that they put out, about six and a half percent of the uh, AOS per, uh, membership was female. So there is a huge, um, uh, deep, uh, small number discrepancy in gender in women in orthopedic surgery and in engineering. And the Perry Initiative was designed and created to inspire young girls to go into the two fields of orthopedic surgery and engineering, which is the two fields that I merged together. So I've been involved in that program for the last 13 years. I've also been highly involved in a program called the National Biomechanics Day um, that's been going on for several years. Um, what, the, what the If Then Initiative has allowed me to do, if you can go to the next slide, is to kind of take those two programs and merge them into and create a new STEM outreach program um, of my own. And it kind of de is developed into three levels. So level one is about creating demonstrations and le lectures and tours. Level two is hands-on experiences. And level three is internships and fellowships. And if you hit uh, a couple more times. I'm not going to go through all this because we're running out of time. But it basically, I have created um, at, here at Scottish Wright a whole outreach program that allows me to bring in girls um, starting all the way from elementary school through college and give them out opportunities to see what we do, have one on one experiences with um, our surgeons, with me, with my lab. And it's been an uh, amazing experience to uh, be able to work with. Um, the If Then program, um, and it was an honor to be chosen, and I'm so very thankful for the opportunity. So 
uh, that's all I have. So thank you. Amazing. Doctors, thank you. We really appreciate your insight this evening. I'm going to jump right into questions. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience and I see some in the poll already that I want to um, address in the chat, sorry. Um, but first I'd like to kick off with a question for each of you. What is the most valuable lesson you've learned being in a group of such like-minded, powerful women as your fellow If Then ambassadors? And I'm going to ask Dr. Mir Puri first. Uh, I think one of the best things I've learned is that even though we come from so many different backgrounds and so many different fields of STEM, we have so many more things in common. Um, and that is the challenge, as you heard all three of us say of, you know, we didn't have mentors that were women. We we, we grew up with the challenge of like trying to kind of pave a way uh, without seeing role models and, um, and that we're breaking uh, some barriers and, and that we are so passionate about sharing our experiences and inspiring the next generation. And, and that I think is one of the best things that I've learned about how even though we're all so different, we all have so many things in common. Um, and that's really brought all of us ambassadors together. All right, so what Julie said is, is absolutely spot on. Um, you know, I remember that the first time Lida brought us all together, it, it was kind it was it was almost eye opening, because, you know, all three of us, we kind of work inside this, you know, biomedical bubble. And you kind of forget about all the exciting science, you know, that actually goes on outside of that. And to bring all of us together, it was it was just amazing because we are all united by this common bond, and and that wasn't just to like do cool science and math and, and medicine, but it was, you know, that we all want to help the next generation of girls behind us, and and I think it was just that it was so exciting, and and I think the other thing, you know, we we bonded over that, and we've all made lasting friendships through it, and um, even even you know like like Julie today. You know, Julie and Nina and I, Kirsten and I, we actually used to play soccer with years ago and it brought us back in touch. But, you know, it's brought us together and collaborations and things that we never thought that would be possible. So, you know, it's, it's been just an amazing experience. And, and like I said, I think the biggest thing was just, just that weird common bond and being in that room with all those women. It was just, it's just such an uplifting experience. Yeah. There's not much to add to their, them. I mean, it's hard to explain the first time that we all got together and uh, and got to see each other and, and got to experience um, the power of all of us in the same room, I think, was pretty amazing. Um, I think for me, one of the most powerful moments was seeing the exhibit for the first time. Um, and, you know, not even just seeing my statue but seeing all of the statues I mean our statues are inside and there's like I think four, 12 or 14 of them inside but actually walking outside and seeing the I think almost 100 of them outside is so powerful and and knowing that every single one of those represents a woman who's trying to make a difference in the lives of other girls is it gives me chills to think about what this program means. And from, I don't know if I'm gonna say this correctly, it's either Evie or Evie, who's a Girl Scout. And she asks this to Dr. Robertson. When there are so many nerves in our cornea, how can it be that contacts don't hurt when they are in your eye? Do we just get used to it? Do they float on the tear film? That is a really great question. So, you know, that. There, there's different types of contact lenses. So most people wear very soft lenses. Um, we also make rigid lenses and rigid lenses are kind of like putting a potato chip on your eye. They actually give you the best vision. It's just, you get vision as good as glasses and they're really healthy for your eyes. But the problem is, is they're so painful and they take so long for people to get used to them that most people wear soft lenses. 
and when you put the the soft lens in your eye it splits your tear film in half so you got fluid in front of it but yes you have fluid behind it and um the softness and the design of the lens along with that fluid is just enough so you don't have that sensation a lot of people the first few times they wear it they actually do get their nerves kind of irritated a bit and in fact um the only reason more people don't wear contact lenses is because they still experience discomfort when they wear the lenses and when they blink and and sometimes when the lenses move so um, it's actually the number one reason people can't wear contacts because not everybody can adapt but yeah your first time or two you'll feel a little sensation and they do kind of i guess in a way float on that tear film and your nerves just quickly adapt to it Thank you. My next question is for Dr. Tolchin Francis. Amy asked, how can girls get involved in this awesome outreach? So I put my email addresses and my Twitter handle in the uh, in there. Please just email me. So, you know, we, we have internships available in uh, Movement Science. Um, the Scottish Rite website has that listed under education, internships kind of have to look on the website a little bit on Scottish Rites website. The best thing to do is actually email me though. Um, we, we also can set up a time for you to come and see the lab. Um, that is a little bit difficult though with COVID right now uh, to come on campus. So the best thing to do is to let me know. Um, part of our if then ambassadorships was to do um, like a mini project, if you will. Um, and my, my project was to take this program that I had established before COVID and to uh, develop uh, virtual programming for it. So we developed like a virtual internship and virtual programming for that. And we have um, a lot of programming for um, high school and, and uh, some program for high school and college kids. So um, definitely reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much for being willing to answer people's questions via email. That is so generous. I'm going to ask one last question from Jen. Has there been an increase in the number of women in sports medicine as more equality has been achieved for women in professional and collegiate athletics? You know, that's a great question. I saw that in there and I actually don't know the numbers specifically for sports medicine. You know, I know that uh, the 2019 numbers for AOS were 6.5% for um, orthopedic surgeons for, fe for females, but I do know that the residency program, um, which means the ones that are training to become orthopedic surgeons, it is slightly higher than that. I think it's around 14%, so it's growing. Um, so I do know that programs like the Perry Initiative, programs like, there's another program called the Nth Dimension, that um, is an also encouraging women and um, uh, other minorities to go into the uh, area of, of, um, of orthopedic surgery is, is working. I don't know if sports medicine in particular is, is, is helping. I don't know. Can, can I add something to that? Yeah. Um, so outside, I guess, just of sports medicine as just kind of looking at healthcare as a whole. Um, and I'm sure Julie probably has um, has heard this too, but whether we look at medical school or dental school, optometry school, and all the health professions, we really are approaching a 50-50 male-female split. And in, in some fields, actually, we're starting to shift over to even hire women. So there has never been a better time for young girls to pursue these types of careers. I mean. This, the time is now, don't be shy, don't let someone tell you you can't, just go full steam ahead because we're ready for you. I love that, I'm sorry, I have one more quick, quick question if you could just answer it in like a quick elevator pitch. Um, it was submitted ahead of time and I really love it. What would you tell your high school or just younger self about the past to where you are today? If you could just give them a quick, word of encouragement, what would it be? Don't be shy, go for it. Have confidence in yourself. I would say, don't let anybody tell you, you can't do it. I had too many people tell me, oh, you can't do this, do something else. You know what? Don't let anyone tell you, you can't do it. If you have a passion for it, go for it. 
Uh, yeah, my uh, my advice is to um, never pass up an opportunity to learn. Um, you should always be a lifelong learner. Um, uh, I think I forgot a slide actually, and that was on my last slide. Uh, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you three so much. I'm going to toss it back to Jenny. Um, I could go on and on about how great that was, but I'm going to stop myself because I know we've gone over. Jenny, back to you. Thank you so much, Joya. Doctors, thank you so much. I, I concur. It was wonderful. And we need another hour to just scrape the surface with you three and your work. It was fascinating. Um, thank you for sharing with us. And we're going to find other ways to ask you back. Uh, we have a Met Ideas that's going to be next spring. And, and we'd love to have you all featured. And maybe some of our Science Cafe audience members can join us. That'll be at Redbird. Date to be determined. Um, and then announced. Uh, our next Science Cafe is on breast cancer and radiation oncology specifically with Dr. Asil Rahimi. And that will be on October 21st. So look for an email. For now, everyone be safe, take care, social distance, wash your hands, get your vaccine, get your booster shot, um, and, and be kind to everyone and have a wonderful night. Thank you so much for joining us and for staying with us this long. It was a joy. Thanks for having us, it was great. And one last thing, Thank shout you. out to the Girl Scouts who are here tonight. Go Girl Scouts. Thank you, Girl yeah. Scouts. Woo.